What's going on, everybody? We got a little special segment here today. We have an actual debate going on. We have Chris at Speaker's Corner, who's going to be debating Dean Responds from Dean Responds. Um, and then we also have um, a co-moderator here, Ibrahim. Welcome, 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 everybody. So as you guys are coming in, make sure you guys hit the like button today. The topic is, does the Quran affirm the previous scriptures? Okay, does the Quran affirm the previous scriptures? So this is how this is going to go, guys. So we have 15-minute intros each. We have one round of seven-minute rebuttals. We have one round of 10-minute cross-examination each. And then we are going to have a three-minute closing for both sides. All right? So 15 minutes going into it, into the intros here. Let me go ahead and set the time. And then, Ibrahim, you can also have a timer set for you over there as well. 15 minutes. <clears throat> Chris, whenever you're ready to start, you can go ahead and I'll start your timer whenever you're ready. Okay? Uh, that's cool. Can you bring up the... There we go. Yep, I see it. Nice, nice. Um, one second. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this debate tonight on whether the Quran affirms the previous scriptures. Now, I want to make this absolutely clear. This is the debate topic for tonight. It is not anything else. It is nothing related to other Christian doctrine. It is nothing related to the Trinity. It is nothing related to New Testament scholarship generally, or New Testament uh, criticism regarding uh, manuscripts, nothing at all to do with this. Rather, it is very simple. Does the Quran affirm the previous scriptures, or does it not? This is the very foundation of what we typically know as the Islamic dilemma. Now, this is a very popular argument that has been made popular by people like David Wood, uh, people like myself, people like others as well, who have been bringing this argument to Muslims, and God logic, who want to make this point profoundly that the Quran is in error. And we can demonstrate it quite simply. The Quran says multiple times that it affirms the previous scriptures, namely the Torah and the Injil. And those will be the two previous scriptures that I am sticking with in this debate tonight. I don't need to argue for any others. I don't need to argue for tonight. I don't need to argue for Paul's letters. I only need to argue for the Torah as it was understood at the historical context of Muhammad's time and the Injil as it was understood and the time of Muhammad. That would have been Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I think my opponent tonight actually agrees with me on this, that it does indeed affirm Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the gospel or the Injil that the Quran talks about. Now, I want to make it clear as well that if at any point during this debate, either me or my opponent tonight start to deviate from this topic, I expect both of us to call this out, and I expect the moderators to jump in and to ensure that this debate doesn't deviate into another topic. I think that's fair, and I think that's important. This is an amazing opportunity for my opponent to defend against the Islamic dilemma and to show once and for all that non-Muslim accusations that the Quran is demonstrably contradict contradictory and false are indeed wrong, and therefore the Islamic dilemma is wrong. That's what tonight's debate is going to be about. Now, historically, there have been different opinions about this. There's been different opinions about whether or not the Torah and the Injil are affirmed by the Quran. What's interesting, though, is that there's a lot of confusion within the Ummah, within the Islamic community, even among the ulama, the scholars. They don't know how to address this. The traditional responses seem to be failing and can no longer satisfy the questions of other Muslims. This is why we have seen, very recently, a split in the Islamic perspective on how to tackle this question. It used to be, perhaps more in a classical sense, that you would have people like my opponents who would defend the idea that yes, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the NGO, but they've been corrupted in some sense. Whereas you now have people like Hamza from Hamza's Den, John Fontaine, who put together an alternative hypothesis because they're dissatisfied with the view my opponent is going to be making tonight. Muslims have debates over this, and some even come to uh, making uh, claims of make, uh, calling other Muslims kafir, like disbelievers, because they have the wrong approach on this, and they're abandoning the opinions of classical Islamic scholars. This, of course, means one thing. The Islamic dilemma has power. It has real weight behind it. And people like my opponent tonight need to be able to defend against it. 
I believe today we are at an absolute pinnacle of demonstrating once and for all that the Islamic dilemma is indeed true and Islam is fundamentally false because the Quran itself is contradictory and false. So let's move on to talk about this Islamic dilemma. Okay, the Quran affirms that the Torah and the Injil, the Gospel, are true revelations sent by Allah. We know this because, for the most part, the Quran actively quotes part of the stories that are well known from the Torah and presents them as being true. It affirms cont continuity with prior prophets. So, for example, the Quran quotes Abraham, it quotes Musa, which is Moses, Isa, which is Jesus, so on and so forth. It claims continuity, and this is a point well understood by both Islamic scholars and secular scholars. For example, Dr. Gabriel Reynolds makes his point that the Quran clearly and without doubt claims to be a continuation of prior scriptures. We also have explicit verses. So, for example, in Surah Al-Imran, Ayah 3, it makes it very clear that the Torah, the Injil, and the Quran are all sent by Allah. Great. We know that the Torah and the Injil are sent by Allah. Great stuff. That same Torah and Injil in the presence of Muhammad are confirmed in the Quran. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that in verses like Surah 7, Ayah 157, Surah 2, 41, Surah 289, Surah 291, Surah 5, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 66, and 68, and many, many more, all demonstrate that the Injil and Torah are present and are confirmed by the Quran directly in the Quran itself. This leads us with no doubt at all that the Quran absolutely affirms the validity of the Injil and Torah. That is present with Muhammad at his time. So we're talking about the 7th century, the 600s, there is a Injil and Torah that are inspired, preserved, and authoritative based on the verses in the Quran that I laid out. Now, point three, the Quran contradicts the Torah and the Injil. The Quran over and over again contains verses that are just not compatible with the prior scriptures. For example, you have the classic Surah An Nisa, Ayah 157, that seems to imply that Jesus didn't die on a cross, which is a claim made in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's a claim that actually the Hebrew people are not the children of Allah. Surah Al Maida, Ayah 18, for example, as many other verses indicate as well. But of course, the Torah is full of verses, Deuteronomy 14, 1, as an example, where the people, the Hebrew people, are described as being children of God. Therefore, we know that the Quran seems to be contradicting itself on the face of things. Is this something that holds up? Is this something that we can test and can demonstrate? It is, indeed, as it seems to be. It does actually contradict. We know from Surah An-Nisa, Ayah, uh, Ayah 82, the Quran gives out criteria, criteria for how to falsify the Quran itself. And the criteria is simple. If you can show there is multiple contradictions, not one, as many states, but the Arabic is very clear, there are multiple contradictions in the Quran, therefore the Quran is an error. Well, if we take the Islamic dilemmas example, then there will be many contradictions in the Quran because it affirms things outside of itself and then goes ahead and contradicts them in other verses. So using the Quran's own criteria, this does indeed make itself very evident to be a, a absolute dilemma for the Muslim perspective because it demonstrates the Quran is self-contradictory. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the Quran is an error. And if the Quran is an error, then it cannot be from God. And if it is not from God, then this would mean that Muhammad is a false prophet and we ought to reject him. Now, here's my second point. I want, to, I want to know exactly how it is possible that corruption of the Torah, let's take the Torah for example, that you can corrupt the Torah universally that is held both by Christians and Jews in written format in, their, in churches and synagogues and as an oral recitation that is being repeatedly recited by Jews in the, in the scholarly sect as well as in Christian scholarship they are reciting it, as well as just the normal communities as part of their own services, as part of the liturgy. The Torah is being recited worldwide. How is it possible that universal corruption can occur? I would argue that is not possible. And I would actually give it up to my opponent to give an example of how such a thing can indeed take place. In order for this to take place, you would need to have 
cooperation between Jews and Christians of different sects, of different worldviews, who fundamentally disagree about matters of theology, cooperating together to alter a book, a Torah, and an oral recitation in the, in the words of hundreds of thousands of people and a minimum without anyone noticing. And then you would have to eliminate the correct original Torah, the Muslim or Islamic Torah, supposedly, so no one knows it. It just vanished. No one knows. No, his, no evidence, no nothing. Such a view is absurd. It is a conspiracy that is so insane and so out there that no rational person can take it seriously. And this, of course, is nothing new. Christians and, and Jews have both been arguing Muslims, making this point ever since the time of Muhammad. Muslims have no response to this, and my opponent tonight won't have any response to it either, because, quite frankly, it is absurd on the face of it, not only because it's not just plausible, it's not even possible. Something like this has never been documented. And, of course, if my opponent wanted to demonstrate that this had occurred, he would actually have to show the original Islamic Injil or the original Islamic Torah. Can he do that? No. Nope. And he never will, because no Muslim can. Because again, it's not true. And we know this because there's no evidence when evidence will be reasonably expected. And that's a criteria. Keep in mind as well, the kind of corruption that's being mentioned here is not corruption of just a text. That's very important to make a distinction. And I want to make sure my opponent picks up on this. Textual altering is not sufficient to solve the Islamic dilemma. You need to have a corruption or a change of the narratives and meanings and stories told within these, uh, within these frameworks, whether that's the oral framework or the textual framework. The point is, is that if you want to change whether or not the Jews are, for example, considered the children of God, you need to not only change verses, but you need to add verses holistically across all five books of the Torah. That is a very radical change than just a small, slight textual addition or subtraction. Can he demonstrate that happened? I'd love to see him try it because no Muslim has ever demonstrated it. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, if what I've said is true, then again, the Quran is an error for another reason, and it's not from God. Oh, sorry. Should have had that slide there. My bad. <laughs> um, so how can Christians follow a corrupted Injil? Now, this is interesting because the Quran has this premise that Surah Al-Maida, for example, Ayah 46, uh, Ayah 47 in particular, as well as Ayah 68, seem to be making a very strong case that Christians have to stand on the Injil or have to follow the Injil in some real sense. This is going to be very problematic for my opponent. And the reason is very simple. The Quran was revealed 600 years after Isa. At some point, my opponent is going to have to argue that it was corrupted in some sense. The issue with that, though, is the Quran makes it clear in multiple verses that there is still a moral duty for Christians to follow it and to stand on it. Otherwise, they are considered among the disbelievers. But the problem is, at this point in history, the Quran isn't around. Maybe we say 300 years prior it was corrupted. The Quran isn't around now to tell them this. In fact, there is nothing around to tell them this. They have no guidance. So how on earth can Christians be held morally accountable for following a scripture that says things like, Jesus is God, Jesus is the son of God, Jesus was crucified, Jesus resurrected. How can Allah honestly take, hold them accountable for following such a thing? The answer, of course, is he can't unless he's either ignorant, in which case Allah is not God because he doesn't know all things, or he's a deceiver, in which case Allah is not the morally greatest being and hence not God. If what I've said is just true, then the Quran is an error and is not from God. My final point, point number three, ladies and gentlemen, is that the Quran doesn't actually know what the Injil is. Now, I think it's fair to say, and Dr. Gabriel Reynolds and others have made this point as well, the Quran does quote, seemingly, to use Gabriel Reynolds' terms, it has uh, biblical reflections, where it seems to be using phrases like um, mustard seed is one, for example, camel, um, easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle is another example, that demonstrate, yeah, it probably is referring to Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke and John. That's fine. But the Quran also seems to think the Injil is other things. And this is where things get very problematic. It might be fair play for my opponent to simply say, okay, I can see Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you know, that's the Injil. I just think it was corrupted. No, that's not good enough. You need to demonstrate why it's not things like the Syriac infancy gospel. 
you need to demonstrate why it's things like not, uh, like, not things like the Proto-Evangelion of James. You're going to struggle because your, your Quran quotes these things, and these things predate the Quran. And these things are found in these works and not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is widely agreed by both Islamic scholars and people like Gabriel Reynolds, people like Robert Hoyland, and so on, people like Fred Donner. There has been many a lot of scholarship that has demonstrated this to be conclusively the case. So you now need to defend these non-canonical sources, which, by the way, contradict the Quran. You have much more work to do to prove that the Islamic dilemma doesn't fail, because even if you do Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you've then got to go into the other non-canonical sources and demonstrate that they are also not being referred to by the Quran, or somehow you have a criteria for shifting between them. But we'll see if you do. If, ladies and gentlemen, that passes and the Quran is an error and is not from God. So, to sum up, there is zero evidence for any corruption of narratives and meanings inside either the Injil or the Torah. There is none. And I challenge my opponent to give me some. He's going to really, really struggle tonight. And has it been said by many people before, that which is said without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. But fortunately for us, we have all the evidence. All of the evidence is on our side. We have all the manuscript accounts. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have the Greek Septuagint. We have the P52. We could go on and on and on. We have the Gregory Allen uh, Category Index for all the manuscripts that we have. We have um, the Center for the New Testament Study of Manuscripts by Dan Wallace. We can go into these things with great detail. But ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, I want to end it here. This is the conclusion. There is no evidence for this. The Islamic dilemma passes, ultimately, and the Quran is false. And if the Quran is false, Islam is false, and Muhammad is a false prophet. All right. Thank you so much. It's about maybe 25, 30 seconds over. Yeah, so either uh, Dean can get another 30 seconds for one of his other periods, or we knock 30 seconds off uh, maybe Chris's rebuttal. So I guess maybe, we'll uh, give it up to Dean. I uh, yeah, I, I guess I guess if we get to the stage where I need the time, I'll, I'll, I'll say to add on to whatever I'm doing. Okay. Um, so, but, well, just real quick, just for this, Dean, I'm going to need you to stay on the camera throughout the debate, brother. Even with the rebuttals and stuff, you got to stay on camera. Okay. Okay. No, yeah, that's fine. All right. So, that was Chris. So, thank you for the opening statement, Chris. So, Dean, whenever you begin to talk, we'll push start on your time. Okay, so um, have you started sharing it yet? Uh, here you go. No, I haven't. I haven't started the timer yet. When, okay. when, whenever you say "here I go" or something. Okay. Um, just one second. Okay, you can start it now. All right. Okay, so the question is: Does the Quran uh, affirm the Bible? Well, the Islamic dilemma. Uh, goes as follows. I'll, I'll try to steal man as as much as uh, I can. Uh, the Quran affirms all of the Bible today. If a Muslim believes that the Quran affirms all of the Bible today, then it will be confirming parts that are contradictory. If a Muslim believes the Bible is corrupt, then they are contradicting the Quran. So these are the two horns of the argument. The first horn is uh, you're conceding to a contradiction in the Quran. The Quran itself says it cannot have a contradiction if it's from Allah. Uh, the second horn will be that you are going against the Quran itself in terms of its beliefs. So the main assumption to talk here is, does the Quran really affirm all of the Bible at its time? Well, the answer is no. The burden, the proof is on Chris to show an absolute confirmation with no exceptions at all to this rule. And inshallah, today I'm going to be going through and destroying that claim of um, absolute confirmation. So th this is my position. Uh, the Quran generally affirms the truths contained with the scriptures at its time. And my my position is laid out by Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Kathir, and Najmadina Tufi. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah makes mention that the Torah includes either the book that was given to Moses or the greater Jewish scriptures. Ibn Kathir says there the same thing, saying that it refers to what was revealed to Musa, Ibn Muran, alayhi salam. Um, or also in the Hadith, it's used uh, in an expansive sense uh, to mean just the greater Jewish scriptures. And Najmadina Tufi makes mention of my position regarding the Injil. Uh, the Injil is made mention by Najmadina Tufi to be possibly um, 
the commandments, parables, and teachings of Isa alayhi salam that's found throughout the Gospels and not the biographical accounts and uh, information outside of the sayings of uh, Jesus, peace be upon him. Obviously, it's going to be a general affirmation of these categories that I've just listed. And the general affirmation will be restricted to whatever is confirmed by the Quran and Sunnah. Anything contradicting it, we are to discard. And anything in between, we are to remain agnostic. We are neither to affirm or deny. Now, I went through all the verses that you know, Chris brings in his videos, and I put them into like different categories. The first category is just confirming what came before. This has no relevancy at all in terms of uh, this quote-unquote Islamic dilemma. This category of verses, it doesn't even require an explanation really, because it's just confirming what preceded the Prophet Sallallahu really has nothing to do with confirming uh, the Bible in the 7th century. <clears throat> now, going to confirming the books at the time of the Prophet uh, well, the confirmation being mentioned here, as I mentioned before, is a general confirmation of the fundamental truths and origins of these revelations and does not affirm the exceptional cases where there are mod modifications. Right? As the verses are listed here, it's confirming their own scriptures at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu as well as asking them to bring the Torah, so they have the Torah in a general sense, as well as saying that they read the scripture. Do they read absolutely everything that is the scripture? That is something for Chris to prove. There's a distinction between a general statement being used or identifying something by a certain amount of its contents, in this case being revelation, and uh, there's a dis distinction between saying that and making an absolute statement that this fulfills all conditions of being titled uh, unconditionally the, the book of Allah in every uh, single sense. So con uh, again, continuing confirming the books at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this general, these types of general affirmations or commands are found like throughout the whole entire Quran. You see, uh, male and female thieves are to have their hands cut off for what they have done. Now, are there, are, in every single case, does a male and female thief have to have their hands cut off? No. If they steal an apple that doesn't meet the requirements of uh, the amount that's needed to be stolen in terms of uh, in terms of the actual value of the thing to actually have their hands chopped off or uh, if there's something wrong with them mentally or if they're stealing out of poverty these are all exceptions to the general rule this isn't to be applied absolutely yet, yet again we see we see here the believers fulfill these conditions they uh, there are men and women who are guardians of one another they encourage good and forbid evil they also establish prayer now establishing prayer uh, obviously uh, a, a woman isn't considered to not be a good believer if they don't establish prayer during their menstruation. So this is, yet again, an, an exception, right? So uh, if you're going to say that there's exceptions to these general affirmations or general commands, and uh, you're willing to be charitable with these verses, then don't be inconsistent when it comes to uh, you know, interpreting the other verses, when it comes to confirming scriptures at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu We see more examples here. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. Uh, obviously, the obedience to Allah and His Messenger uh, is an absolute obeyance. And, but when it comes to obeying those in authority among you, that won't be an absolute obeyance. There's going to be exceptions to the rule. If my ruler tells me to prostrate down to an idol, I'm not to obey the ruler. So this is an exception to the rule that Allah SWT stipulates. Again, do not marry polytheistic women until they believe. Is that a contradiction in the Quran now when we have another verse that's revealed that says you can marry from Ahl al-Kitab, you can marry from the Jews and Christians? No, it's, not, it's just a general rule that there's an exception for which Allah stipulates later on. So just having basic hermeneutics and being terrible to the text. Uh, so yeah, here, here's an example from Matthew 23, right? You have Jesus commanding the Pharisees. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Uh, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, right? But the Pharisees, they taught the oral law, right? So if this is not just a general command. This is an absolute command. And we go like with sort of uncharitable reading of texts. This is going to be a contradiction because we see times where Jesus, peace be upon him, in the Gospels, he actually condemns the Pharisees for certain oral practices, right? So he doesn't believe in everything that they teach. The Pharisees also teach that Jesus, peace be upon him, isn't the Messiah. Is he saying to take those teachings from the Pharisees? Is he, is he saying uh, for, <clears throat> for his disciples and for his followers to go ahead and believe absolutely everything? Of course not, as I, as I just made mention. Uh, this is a restricted obeyance. This is an absolute. So let's be consistent now. And be charitable, just as I'm being charitable with the text here, be charitable with the Qur'an when it makes uh, general stipulations and general commands. So, yeah, now we get to the another category of verses that Chris lists. Uh, he, he lists these verses where apparently uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, is confirming what was at his time, right? Now, uh, it's kind of a bad translation to say, is uh, actually confirming what's between the hands at the time. But I'm willing to grant it, even if we grant this, right? Even if we grant that Jesus, peace be upon him, is confirming the Torah at his time. Again, this is the general sense. Like my methodology, the basic hermeneutics and basic uh, 
uh, you know, being terrible to the text, it allows for, for all of these to be harmonized very simply. The burden of proof is on Chris to show evidence that there is no, there's no actual exceptions to these rules, and that it's an absolute uh, confirmation, which he won't be able to do. Uh, here's another uh, type of commonly misunderstood verse: uh, "The word of Allah can't be changed." These verses are just taken completely out of context, right? These are like this is how weak uh, this argument is. They rely upon things being taken out of context. There's nothing in the surrounding context that suggests that the words of Allah here is referring to uh, the Torah and Injil on earth in this dunya. If you look at the context, the previous verse in Surah Al-Kahf, uh, chapter, chapter 18, it says, How perfectly he hears and sees. They have no guardian besides him, and he shares his command with none. Then he goes on to say, None can change his words, nor can you find any refuge besides him. Linking no refuge besides him to the fact that they can't find any guardian besides him, as well as his word being linked to his command. And then you have uh, in Surah Al-An'am, uh, chapter 6, verse 114, uh, what links to the fact that no one can change Allah's words here is yet again his decree, it's his command. Uh, when he promises something is going to be fulfilled. In this case, it's the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu The fact that those who are given the scripture know that what has been revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu is the truth. How do they know this? They know this because this is foretold in the scriptures, right? So the context is clear. There's no, there's no affirmation of the Torah and Injil in, in, in this life. And if someone could tell me the time, just real quick. Uh, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay. Yeah. So we now we're going to go into like the the arguments that the Quran, the Quranic author, I should say, believes in some form of corruption. Now, whoever um, Chris wants to take the Quranic author to be, it's very apparent, and you have to be very disingenuous to say that the Quranic author doesn't actually edit biblical knowledge that he has. The, the author of the Quran appears to be familiar with the contents of the Torah and Injil at the time, as Chris mentioned in his rebuttal, right? He, uh, there's an expansive um, account of Abraham, uh, Joseph's story, uh, Jesus' story, uh, David, Solomon, peace be upon them all. Uh, so how does he go ahead and be, how does he ignorantly assign these uh, you know, alterations or these uh, additions to the scriptures? It does, it does not make any sense. And we have one first example of this, right? We have an example of uh, Moses' skin uh, having a disease, having leprous. And the Quran uh, already explicitly denies this by saying it's un unblemished, right? His skin was unblemished uh, in this account. And the Quran has an expansive account of um, the story of Moses, peace be upon him. It, it clearly knows there's a particular section that it does not agree with, and it's editing it. Yet again, we have the fact that uh, the heavens and earth were created in six days by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that he was not even touched with fatigue. In Exodus, we see uh, that God is said to have made the heavens and earth in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Yet again, from Exodus, the clear indication that the Quranic author knows stuff from Exodus and is intentionally uh, going ahead and editing it as it doesn't confirm. <laughs> the, author, the Quranic author does not uh, confirm absolutely everything. Again, a very obvious one. Uh, so if, if you are to tell me that the Quranic author is ignorant of Jesus, peace upon him, dying and being resurrected according to the Gospels, that's just going to be the biggest cope. You're saying that John Fontaine had a conspiracy uh, theory, Torah, and Injil. Well, this this requires a conspiracy that the, the individual who made the Quran, from your perspective, had an ignorance of fundamental doctrines from the Injil and yet was able to extract uh, other, other information that isn't as uh, fundamental. You can't have your cake and eat it. If, if you are saying that he's copying from traditions, then how is he overlooking these basic fundamental traditions that he's contradicting? Obviously, he knows the content of the Injil says Jesus was resurrected and crucified. And uh, the Quran rejects that, saying Jesus, son of, uh, saying that the Jews boasted, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they neither killed nor crucified him. It was only made to appear so. And it obviously uh, calls... Um, Calls this um, people only making assumptions and conjecture, uh, this idea. And where does this idea stem from? From the Injil in their hands. There's a level of corruption. Uh, the Quranic author would not be ignorant of this. Another Four argument, Four another argument, another argument from the Quran is that there are prominent uh, figures that are well versed within the scriptures, and yet still don't bring this uh, this dilemma up. Abdullah bin Salam was a knowledgeable, knowledgeable Jew at his time, during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And he would have known the, the contents of the Torah extensively. The Jews at his time in Medina uh, praised him as being knowledgeable. So why does he ever notice this apparent contradiction? He tests the Prophet with certain questions, right? And he eventually converts to Islam, as his hadith says. So, so yet again, it, it, it is to be asked, 
why doesn't he notice this contradiction if it's so apparent? Well, obviously because you're doing horrible hermeneutics. And then we have Salman al-Farisi, who was uh, once a Christian who converted to Islam. And he's able to identify the Prophet ﷺ by a prophecy in Isaiah 9. Right? And he's so well versed in the scriptures that he can identify the Prophet so. But you're telling me that he's not able to identify the fact that there's contradictions between the new book that he believes in, the Quran, and the previous book. Even though the new book is meant to be affirming everything in the old book, uh, that makes no sense at all. How is he not able to identify this? Are they all just too obtuse to identify this? Only Chris and his buddies, uh, David Wood and, and Sam Shamoon, are able to identify this? Like, is this claiming a complete conspiracy? Now, you have the Christians from uh, Najran as well. Uh, you would expect a level of criticism from even outside um, places such as Najran as they criticize the Prophet uh, coming with a verse saying that. Uh, Aaron was the brother of uh, Maryam alayhi salam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam uh, told the companion that heard this criticism from the Christians and told, uh, told him the explanation. Uh, the issue here is, well, the Christians of Najran were hearing the Quran and they, uh, they took upon themselves to criticize this particular verse. But whenever they would hear that the Quran would affirm a, a, the a complete uh, Bible they have in their hands and yet contradict itself many of times, they're not willing to bring that up, right? Like we expect it to be at least some level of criticism from knowledgeable Jews, knowledgeable Christians, or or, uh, or reverts to Islam. Now, uh, the last section will be that the Quran leads us to the Hadith. The Quran tells us to obey the Prophet sallallahu and also says he does not speak from his whims or his desires. We have an explicit Hadith from the Prophet sallallahu saying explicitly that the Bible has been distorted. He says, "Fakala Nabi Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam." Meaning, they lied about their prophets just as they distorted their book. Right. So we have not just this narration explicitly from the Prophet ﷺ that is authenticated by the standards of Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari, but we also have corroborating narrations that makes it massively transmitted that this was the attitude of the earliest companions. We have Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, the man that the Prophet ﷺ made dua for, uh, for him to excel in his uh, exegesis of the Quran. He, he says that uh, concerning the Muslims, our group of Muslims, how can you ask the people of the scriptures about anything while your book, which Allah has revealed to your prophet, contains the most recent news from Allah and is pure and not distorted? He's contrasting the Quran being pure and not distorted to what? The scriptures that they have in their hands. Allah has told you that the people of the scriptures have changed some of Allah's books and distorted it and wrote something within their own hands and said, this is from Allah so as to have a minor gain for it. We see the same attitude being expressed by a companion asking Uthman ibn Affan, May Allah be pleased with them, saying, O oh, command of the believers, save this nation before they differ about the book as the Jews and the Christians did before them, the book being the Quran. So obviously saying that the Jews and Christians differed over what, what the scripture was. There was a level of corruption that, that went on. Then finally, uh, what's my time? Uh, it's 45. It's 14.45, but you can take the extra 45 seconds if you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll take it. Yeah, so, so then just a couple, a couple of extra mentions. Uh, Quran chapter two, verse uh, verse seventy nine. Uh, you know, people like Chris and Sam Shamoon that like uh, and God Logic are like proponents of this argument. They do always do mental gymnastics on this verse. It's it's apparent. It's clear. Woe to those who distort the scripture with their own hands. They say this is from Allah, seeking a fleeting gain. Clearly, the case that there's a level of corruption going on at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that it was it is possible to corrupt uh, the, the very words that are in the books at the time. In Quran chapter 5, verse 48, it says, it mentions the word min in, in, in the Arabic, which means from, giving precedence to my explanation that uh, the Quran at the time of the Prophet uh, is only affirming uh, sections from the Bible uh, that are parts and not and not the whole, not the entirety, right? Uh, and yeah, uh, th that should be it. So if you, think, if you think that the Quran does actually affirm the Bible, then you're just a certified clown, right? Because as, as I showed throughout my whole presentation, there's so many reasons not to affirm this. And it, people, Christians just shoehorn this uh, argument in because they're trying to cope with the fact that they can't bring anything that's of substance against the concept of God in Islam or other theological things. Rather, they just, they just try to like uh, carry on like some, some straws like uh, the Quran of the Bible nonsense. All right. So that was Dean's opening statement. So now we're going to go ahead and go into the, uh, the rebuttal section. So Ibrahim, if you can keep my time as I start the rebuttal section, you keep mentioning me. Um, so Dean, I'm, no, I'm just messing with you. Uh, so Chris, whenever you're ready, seven minutes 
for the rebuttal section. All right. And you let me know when you want me to press start. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> cool. So first of all, he says the, the debate is all about whether or not all of the Bible is affirmed. No, that's not true at all. In fact, the Islamic dilemma needs only a fraction of the whole Bible to be affirmed by the Quran in order for the Islamic dilemma to pass through. I don't know why he framed it this way. He should know better than that, to be honest, at this point, having done work and homework on this to prepare for this debate. He said the burden of proof is on me. The burden of proof isn't on me at all. The Quran claims it affirms the Injil and Torah. We know what the Injil and Torah are. He doesn't argue with me with that. He agrees with me. He thinks the Injil is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Great. So why does the Quran affirm it? When the entire narrative, let's take the Injil, the entire narrative of the Injil from Matthew, Mark, Luke to John all affirm some, uh, some pretty anti-Islamic things, like Jesus is the Son of God. That's literally Mark 1.1. Mark is the earliest gospel. It starts off with a divine proclamation right at the beginning. We, I mean, I, have, you know, I can't even imagine what you'll do when you get to John. But from the very beginning, the Injil's narratives are that, yeah, uh, Jesus is the, is the Son of God. He is divine. John 14, th uh, verse 13 to 14, you can pray to Jesus in his name and he'll answer your prayers. John 16, 30, everything the Father knows, Jesus knows. John 20, 28, Jesus is called God, my Lord and my God, by Thomas directly. These are central to the narrative. The whole, like, Mark 10, 45, Jesus is not only here uh, to be served, but to serve. Uh, and he will give his life as a ransom for many. That's built into the whole narrative, and it's and it, it flows throughout the entire thing. Um, yeah, so the plain reading is that the Quran affirms all this stuff, at least generally. As you say, my opponent says generally. So I guess generally it affirms that Jesus is the Son of God. Generally, he was sent to die for the atonement of our sins. Generally, he was sent by the Father. Generally, uh, he sent the Holy Spirit uh, after he ascended uh, to the right hand of the Father. Generally, he resurrected. You see, of course, generally makes no sense here. You cannot apply the term generally to the injury. It makes no sense. Same with the Torah. I guess generally, Torah says uh, in Exodus 3.14, the name of God, yod heh -Vav -Heh. I guess generally, repeatedly throughout the Torah, Jesus had, uh, sorry, uh, repeatedly throughout the Torah, the Hebrew people are referred to as the children of God. I mean, it's, it's impossible to think of it generally. It doesn't even make sense in that context. Uh, you have to be a bit of a crazy person to write a book, for example, totally contradict everything the Quran says, and then for a Muslim to come along and say, I affirm what's in this book, but only generally. Well, what does that mean? The whole book is, is totally anti-Islamic from the beginning to the end. So how can you affirm it generally? Now, he uses the Quranic criteria to judge this kind of thing. He's saying, look, we can just take the Quran, whatever the Quran agrees with that's in the Torah and the Injil, we'll agree with it as well. Whatever it disagrees with, oh, we, we know that's corrupted. First of all, this is, uh, this is basically going in a circle. It starts off with the assumption the Quran is true, which is the very thing the Islamic dilemma questions. So hang on a second. You start off with the assumption the Quran is true, and you go around to get to the conclusion that the Quran is true. It's a circular point. You can't do that. You can't just assume the Quran is the criteria. Unless, of course, you want to accept that it is a circular argument. Also, notice he had no explicit statements in any of that uh, introduction that explicitly said that the injury and the Torah have been corrupted. There wasn't anything in there. Nothing explicit at all. The best he could do was 275, uh, 275 to 279, I assume is what he's meaning there, which is weird because he says it's clear that this involves some sort of universal corruption. I mean, again, my, my, one of my points was that universal corruption isn't possible because it has to be done worldwide in all the synagogues, in all the churches, universally to achieve this. He hasn't explained how that's possible. I really would like you, my opponent, Dean, to explain how that is possible, universal corruption. I don't think it is. How long do I have left? got three minutes okay he said 279 is like oh yeah it definitely shows that you can do this i'm sorry do you know what al tabari said about 279 do you know what ibn ashak said about 279 they did not tie it to what you think you to that specific thing they did not say this is universal corruption they tie it to specific actions that happened at the lifetime of the prophet of jews in particular removing muhammad's description from the torah yeah that's not universal corruption dean you need to be better with that because that's not correct at all uh, yeah, a lot of your arguments were just arguments from silence, which is weird because you even titled it on your presentation. Why the argument from silence? And I'm like, well, you're making it. I don't need to. There's no reasonable expectation that we would have all these things documented in the Islamic tradition 
Why on earth would it be documented in the Islamic tradition? That's biased. I mean, most scholars don't even take the Hadith stuff seriously as an actual account of historicity. So for that reason, I see no reason why I would. If you want more on that, you can look at Dr. Jonathan Little on his research onto Hadith, Isnads, and whatnot. Uh, whatnot. Um, so yeah, was there any manuscript evidence of this Islamic in jail Torah that he presented? Nope, not any, because there isn't any. Again, he has no evidence. So he is arguing from uh, just an absence of evidence, really. Um, yeah, he tried to then frame things as like, me saying the Quran is wrong is some big conspiracy. No, it's really simple. Muhammad, whoever he was, just didn't understand what the Injil and Torah were exactly. He couldn't read or write, so he had to hear things, which is ironically also recorded in the Quran. Muhammad is called the ear because he just hears things and he repeats them. That would explain why he gets a lot of the stories generally right, but then totally contradicts the prior scriptures without really having any knowledge of it. He probably thought Christians and Jews were just making it up. Uh, I didn't realize they were actually coming from scripture. Yeah, then you use the Hadith where, and I thought you'd pivot to Hadith, because again, the Quran itself cannot be defended alone. You have to go elsewhere. The Hadith explicitly says, oh, yeah, it's been distorted. Yeah, show me a Hadith where it says it's been universally corrupted. You'll never find one because they don't exist. In fact, there's vastly more Hadith where the Torah and the Injil are spoken of positively than are ever spoken negatively. You can find people like Dr. Gordon Nickel affirming this, Dr. Martin Akkad affirming this, and even Islamic scholars affirming this. This is very basic stuff. 40 lastly, seconds. lastly, I just want to say, you ended that by saying that we were clowns. When you resort to insults, Dean, it demonstrates the weakness of your position, and I would expect better from you. It's not appropriate for you to insult me or Avery or anyone here. Instead, be very choice with your words and ensure that you refrain from insulting anyone during this debate. That's my time. Thank you so much, Chris. Okay. So, all right. So that's the seven minute rebuttal there. All right, Dean, whenever you're ready, let me know when to press start. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, you can sign up. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, in your introductory statement, there was a bunch of like a, a bunch of waffle. You were, you were saying that, uh, oh, there's differing opinions between Hamza and John Fontaine, and you know, they're, they're having a difference of opinion. Okay, so what? Like, <laughs> what's I got to do with the Quran referring to the Bible, right? Uh, right, so you did the composition fallacy in your introductory uh, statement as well. You assume just because the Quran affirms parts of the Bible, therefore it has to affirm all of it. That's uh, arguing from part to whole uh, when you mention like all the stories in Abraham and so on. I just the issue of like affirming the Torah and Injil. Uh, at the time of the Prophet as like a, a general affirmation. Uh, you misunderstood that as being like, oh, general means, oh, just like the majority, there's not really a right, a right criteria. No, no, I told you the criteria, right? And then you said that it was circular. Well, if you're critiquing the Quranic conception, right? This isn't like a Christian or Jew that has some <laughs> conception about the Quran affirming the Bible or, uh, or anything like that. It's the Quranic conception of what the Injil and Torah is it is not circular for me to me to appeal to the Quran standards. That is not circular. Um, your point about uh, was that I think yeah, the, them being like sons of God. This has to be like major alteration. No, I can accept that during the uh, prior to the Prophet Muhammad's time, uh, during Jesus' time, and during the time of the Old Testament, people were allowed to title themselves as sons of God. Ibn Taymiyyah makes mention of this. Ibn Kathir makes mention of this. This was a possible title was used back then with the proper meaning. This, this was allowed in a metaphorical sense, not in a literal sense. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 5, it even makes mention uh, that the house of Israel are not titled as sons of God when they sin when uh, and, and that they lose that title, right? So this is uh, in direct uh, parallel with the Quranic verse uh, that you had in mind in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 18. Uh, right, and then you mentioned how, okay, how could be corrupted if... Uh, how could be corrupted if you would have to grab all the Torahs and Ejidahs at the time? I never made mention that the corruption occurred at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu The corruption would occur usually at times when it, uh, there wasn't mass transmission or lack of people that were literate, lack of people having access to the scriptures, right? Um, I, I don't need to show you an original Torah and Injil. I think you're conflating my position with, with the John Fontaine's. I don't need to. I accept the Torah and Injil today as being generally from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, you mentioned how, how can they follow a corrupted Injil at the time, by the way? Uh, how can they follow a corrupted Injil uh, if they're told to judge by it? It's been well, two and a half minutes. Well, they're asking the Prophet so I send him for judgment. So, of course, the Prophet is going to answer from his perspective and say, you should follow the commands that are found within your own book. 
it will be hypocritical for you to ask the Prophet for judgment when you have generally the commandments of Allah within there. Muqattal bin Sulaiman also makes mention of this, where he says that um, here this would include parts of the Injil that have to do with like uh, jurisprudential things, such as like forgiving uh, the murderer and, and, and so on. These are the things that the Quran uh, does teach as uh, stuff that uh, possibly Isa would have preached. And he also made mention that, yeah, okay, well, why is the Injil not outside of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, right? Well, I'm not constricted to my definition of it just being Mark, Mark Matthew, Luke, and John. It's I told you, it's the commandments, sayings, and, th and teachings of, of Jesus, peace be upon him. I never constricted it just to Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Um, you also, yeah, um, you restricted to like a verbatim word fallacy as well. Uh, you <laughs> Like, I don't need to show you a, uh, something from the Qur'an. This is like uh, explicitly saying that everything universally uh, is corrupted of the Torah and the Injil. This is very analogous to uh, whenever Muslims tell you, can you show me one equivocal, unequivocal verse in the Bible that says Jesus is God? You'd say, no, you know from the meanings, you can extract from the meanings, being charitable to the text that actually we can derive from the meanings that he is God, right? So again, we, you're lacking consistency. Um Right, and I think the final thing I'll just uh, make mention is that you didn't, yeah, so you didn't really address my argument for, uh, about uh, this being like an argument from silence, right? Arguments from silence, uh, well, yeah, arguments from silence aren't inherently fallacious. Uh, they're only fallacious when you wouldn't expect there to be evidence. We would expect there to be evidence of some sort of uh, reconciliation happening or some, some sort of criticism happening at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu just as there was things that happened at the time of the Prophet where there were critiques on the content of the Quran, such as Aaron being the brother of Mary, uh, Mary uh, peace be upon her. So yeah, you would expect something to be written there. Even if you think these are like ad hoc uh, explanations coming from the Quran, e even if you're to think that from your perspective, why isn't there some ad hoc explanation coming for why the Quran doesn't actually affirm the Bible? If this is such an issue that uh, early generations of Muslims would be, would be exposed to, is everyone just too obtuse, everyone's too dense to see this issue? Right? So this isn't fallacious. You're saying, oh, it's an argument from silence. It's to be expected, you're going to say that, right? You don't understand fallacies, Chris. You don't understand that arguments from silence aren't inherently fallacious. You would expect it to be evidence of someone making such a critique. One minute, 45 seconds left. Right. Um, maybe I can get through... Yeah, he mentioned uh, differing opinions amongst like uh, early Muslim scholars as well. There's differing opinions amongst uh, early Muslim scholars about so many things, right? Uh, there's almost not a thing you can find within fiqh where um, they don't actually uh, on a consensus agree. There's so many disagreements happening uh, ever pertaining to that. Uh, so yeah, there, there could be differing opinions and scholars could get things wrong. That, that's totally fine. Um, uh, the final thing I would just say uh, is uh, just to, just to clarify again with with what I was saying before about general affirmation. Uh, general affirmation being made uh, doesn't include uh, those sort of um, things that would contradict the Quran, right? And you made mention of these, uh, you know, Jesus being crucified and uh, Jesus dying being, being mentioned in the Gospels, and the Quran contradicts that. The Quran also contradicts other things that I made mention of in my introductory statement that you didn't address, where we would expect the Quranic author to affirm if the Quranic author's attitude was actually, hey, uh, all of the Bible is, is preserved. He makes mention of the of the story of Exodus from the beginning, almost, uh, regarding the story of Moses, till the end. And there's always some exceptional thing being mentioned where it's clearly intentional, where the Quranic author says, basically, this isn't preserved. This isn't what I agree with. You haven't addressed this. Right. If you're going to say, oh, there's just some oral tradition that the Quranic author is hearing and is mixing up what's, what's the Torah and what's the Injil, well, you need to substantiate that. You need to actually show proper evidence that during the time in Mecca where the Prophet ﷺ would recite, where he would uh, give these stories. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll just say like the, a final statement. You, you need to substantiate <laughs> that the, the Prophet ﷺ, when he says these stories in Medina, uh, sorry, in Mecca, that he would be exposed to these oral traditions and they would be consistent with the Quranic narrative. All right. Thank you for that rebuttal session, fellas. Going into the cross-examination. So there's going to be 10 minutes cross-examination for each party. So whenever you um, want to start, we can get that going. Actually, 
um, I wanted to ask you guys, did you guys want to do a Q&A after from the audience? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, that's, that's fine. That's cool, Chris. Yeah, but uh, do you think we'll, be, we'll have a, like an even number of questions? Because since it's on a Christian channel and Dean isn't, so uh, some true. like... Yeah, once I was doing a debate, it was on a Muslim channel. We had like no questions for me. Most mm -hmm. of the questions were great. So I don't know if you want someone else to, uh, like, if we can get some Muslim, we could give him multiple questions. If you have none, I could do it. Or we could ask some, uh, someone, Dean, you know, some of Dean friends to come on or ask if you want to, like, even. Yeah, if they're, you know? yeah if, they're, if they're watching the debate, I'm pretty sure some of Dean's, like, Dean, you got people watching the debate now? Yeah, I got some people. How about we just do uh, th uh, three questions each, and I'll, I'll grab like three people that would want to inquire on Chris's position. I was gonna so, watch the debate before I <laughs> became a mod at the last minute. But I think we're gonna have to find someone else to watch it. For sure. All right, let's get into the cross examination. Chris, whenever you're ready, let me know, and we both, me and Ibrahim, will start the time. Sure thing. <clears throat> okay, so then. Do you have any manuscripts of either the Islamic tour in Injil? Uh, of the uncorrupted form? Yeah. Uh, no, we don't have any manuscripts at the time of Jesus, neither at the time of uh, Moses, peace be upon them both. No manuscripts. Okay. Um, do you have any records of Isa's companions quoting the Islamic Injil? Of Jesus' companions? Isa's companions, from your perspective, the Islamic perspective. Um... Of the companions quoting the Injil, we have times where yeah. in, in, had, in hadiths they're mentioned in the Quran. In the Quran, they're, they're mentioned uh, where it references uh, times uh, stuff found within the Gospels. Yeah. No, I mean, so like, I, 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 I don't, I don't know. From, from within the Quran, are you talking about? So I'm talking about from. So we have like church fathers that quote uh, the Gospels, for example. So do you have Isa's companions or some equivalent quoting the Islamic Injil? Within the Quran hadiths, you're asking. Anywhere. It, it can be any writing. No, I, I don't I don't see why that would be a necessary condition, though. We don't have anything no. like that. Recorded. Testimony. Okay. Um, do you have any evidence at all of any Islamic in or Torah? Uh, I, I just told you, so it's in an unpreserved form, no, that we, we wouldn't have. No evidence of Torah or in -jil. Okay, so when was the Torah corrupted? Yeah, so it would be corrupted, as I said before, uh, during a time where it wouldn't be massively transmitted. And like Ar-Razi makes mention of this, Ibn Taymiyyah makes mention of this. At times where it wasn't massively transmitted is most likely the time where it was corrupted. They make mention of it being possibly during like the Babylonian exile. Okay, so this was before Isa? Yep. Okay, but Isa confirmed the Torah that he had. Yeah, he generally confirmed the truths found within it. Uh, I told you, like, I made mention of this in my opening statement. Uh, I don't think you followed it. So a prophet can confirm a corrupted book? Yes, he can generally confirm the truths within the corrupted book, yes. But he called it the Torah, when it's not the Torah, is it? Yes, we identify things by um, the contents of it being the majority, and the majority of the Torah is preserved. So he would call it Kitab Allah, he would call it the Book of Allah, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah okay. makes mention of makes mention of this that the uh, Torah is mostly preserved, so it only makes sense that he would identify by the majority of its contents. Okay, is the majority of the Injil preserved? The Islamic Injil? Uh, no, no, I, I wouldn't be able to to know that because okay, it's so never called. The Quran... it's, yeah, it's never called Kitab. It's never called Kitab Allah. It's never called the words of Allah. It's only made mentioned in parts where uh, to to actually apply it, it would be titled as uh, Injil, never as those titles as I mentioned before. So. Uh, in terms of the speeches, commandments, and preachings and parables, uh, they're generally found there in semi-corrupted forms. So if you're going to say in that sense, the, the, the speech of, of Jesus, peace be upon him, I wouldn't be mind in saying that uh, there's, a, there's a good amount preserved within it. But it's not the majority. I wouldn't be able to give you like a percentage on the Injil. Yeah, I wouldn't mind in saying it's a majority as in more than 50%. I wouldn't mind in saying. Okay, so but, 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 but me, but, yeah, but just, but just, just let me clarify for ten seconds. So even even if I was to hold the position that it's not more than fifty percent, uh, a general confirmation of Jesus' statements, uh, it's not. It, it doesn't have to be more than fifty percent. Is what I'm saying. Wait, so it doesn't have to be a majority. No. 
I thought you said earlier, as long as it was the majority when you talked about the Torah. No, no, I, uh, I was saying that. I was saying that that's a point that makes sense that you would identify something by the majority of its contents. It's an intuitive point. It's an intuitive point that I'm saying regarding the Torah. It's not a consistent approach where you have to apply this for every single thing. It's not a consistent approach. Yeah. So you have one approach for the Torah. And one it, for it, the this is no. This is one justification for the Torah specifically. It's not a justification for the energy. But the Injil is affirmed as a reserved, inspired, and authoritative book like the Torah is. You're aware of that in the Quran. In a general sense, yes. But so you can generally affirm the minority part of a book. No, it's generally affirming a good chunk of the book. It doesn't have to be the majority, as I said. So a minority. A minority, if you're saying minority as in less than 50%, I can't give you an exact percentage. I'm right. asking for exact percentage, just just like yeah. if it's not the majority that you're referring to, it must be the minority. So a prophet can come and affirm, affirm the minority of a book. He can affirm the contents that are from God, even if it's a minority. Okay, where did he explicitly point out all the cases uh, where it agrees and where it doesn't agree? In, sorry, in repeat that. So in the Quran, where does it explicitly point out the parts that it agrees with and are preserved and then points out the parts that are corrupted and it does not affirm. Yeah, so are you talking about specifically in the Injil here? Yeah, in the Injil, we'll take the Injil. Yeah, in the Injil, yeah, so so in the Injil, uh, there are parts of like the parable of the ten virgins, it's mentioned in the Quran. Um, yeah. That That is uh, contrasted and there's parts in there where the Quranic author obviously edits uh, the parable. Okay, but how do you know specifically what parts are preserved and what parts aren't? In well, what's confirmed in, yeah, by what's confirmed in the Quran. Okay, so if the Quran is silent about an issue, what do you do? It's only agnostic. I mentioned this in my introductory. Okay, so let's take, for example, in the Torah, in Genesis 19.36, I believe, although I'll get the verse up, it talks about Lot having sex uh, with his daughters. Does the Quran yeah. affirm this? No, it doesn't uh, affirm it. Does it deny it? It denies this uh, by extension of prophets not being able to commit uh, major sins. Where does it say that in the Quran? It's an inference. It's not a verbatim, uh, oh, it not a verbatim word. Why it's is it even further, actually? It's extrapolated and inferred from other Quranic verses that make mention how prophets can't you lie. Tell me what those are. How? How? Yeah. Can, can you only finish? So mm -hmm. there's other. So there's other uh, verses that make mention of uh, prophets not lying, as well as we. Whenever we do see uh, uh, um, operations. They're usually in parts where prophets do sin. So Aaron, for example, creating the golden calf, or for example, uh, David, peace be upon him, uh, committing adultery and and, uh, and murder. Uh, in instead, in the Quran, this is replaced with uh, obviously a parable being given. So uh, there's many instances where this is the case in the Quran, or even Solomon committing kufr, Solomon disbelieving. So on these cases, the Quran consistently edits these passages. Uh, so you can infer from that that this is, wouldn't be something that would be time to. Time's up. I still got three minutes left. No, <laughs> no, right. if you oh, sorry, oh, oh I'm tripping, I'm tripping. Yeah. No, it's seven minutes, isn't it? No, no, it's ten. It's oh, okay. it's seven. That's my fault. That's my fault. Well, wait, sorry, it, it, it is ten. My bad, yeah, ten. My bad, sorry. sorry. But I'll go. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'll continue, right? Yeah, yeah I'm just, I paused your time for a second. So right now, I got two minutes and 40 seconds left. <laughs> okay, cool. So in the in the Torah, it makes it clear in Genesis nineteen thirty six that Lot had sex with his daughters. The Quran, however, never explicitly denies this or even says this didn't take place. In fact, the Quran <laughs> seems to infer the prophets did sin. So why not just accept that this did actually happen? Because the Quran seems to refer this as a principle. Yeah. So the conception that the Quran uh, presents is one of prophets being able to commit uh, the noob, meaning like sins, but in a, in a minor sense, not in a major sense. I gave you inferences that scholars would bring that would deny these particular instances as being, you know, these major sins, because it's, con it's a consistent theme where the Quran does reject these uh, narratives in the Bible that accuse these prophets of doing uh, heinous deeds and major sins. So it's a principle that's extrapolated and inferred from, from the text. Would you still hold that principle if I could show you that actually in the Quran it still even does affirm prophets doing sins? For example, Musa killing uh, an unarmed person, potentially a believer. Yeah, uh, that wouldn't be considered uh, a major sin because uh, for, firstly, 
uh, that was like you can explain this in so many ways. Uh, first of all, uh, the legislation from God hadn't been given to Musa alayhi salam on particular, on, uh, particularly on this account. Secondly, uh, Musa alayhi salam, uh, when he did unalive this person, he was doing it on the pretense that this person was uh, unjustly uh, mm -hmm. harming someone. And lastly, he uh, didn't mean to, uh, to actually kill this person. He meant only to uh, push him away. Did Abraham lie? Yeah, uh, those those lies that Abraham committed uh, were white lies, or they they're, they're seen to be lies that were would be permissible. They, they aren't they aren't seen to be sins. How do you know they're permissible? Yeah, so there are certain cases where people can commit white lies, for example, or an Islamic Does paradigm. In the like, uh, this is in the hadith. Okay, so the Quran is not a criteria for you. Uh, the Quran is part of my criterion. You're asking me for my perspective. I use both Quran and Hadith. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a Quranist, right? 30 right. seconds. Well, the Quran itself, though, is not a criteria. It is not a Muhammad or a Fulkan in the sense that 548 would have you assume. Oh, uh, it is. Uh, it definitely is. And because it is, uh, it tells me to go to the Hadiths. And because the criterion and uh, the Fulkan and the Muhammad, the, the Guardian, tells me to go to the Hadiths, tells me to go to the Prophet. I extrapolate contents from there as well. So this is consistent within the Quranic narrative. Okay, so the Quran tells you that it's a criterion. That, that's and it. Yet you go to you go to other things. So okay, it's not. But I'll let you if you want, if you wanted to just last ask that last question. I'll let Dean respond to that too, since the, the time. Or is that it? Good there. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll just respond to that. So um, right. part of it being the, part let, of it. Let's let him restate the because I it, I yeah. cut him off a little bit. Go ahead and restate yeah. the question, last question, Chris. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, you, you keep you have said, and I, I know it's a position that you take, that you hold to Surah Al-Maidah, Ayah 48, as mentioning the Quran as a criteria, Muhammad, over the prior scriptures. But I'm pointing out that you actually don't hold this position. What you actually hold is a position where you take the Quran and other things that include hadith, schools of fiqh, scholarly works. Actually, that's your criteria. So, in effect, Islam is your criteria. Right. So, uh, can I ask a clarifying question for that? Sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, do you believe when the Quran says it's the criterion or it's the Muhammad? This is used in an absolute sense, or is this general? So do you think do you think the Quran is a criterion over uh, even what's right and wrong in a, in, a, in a maths equation? I don't think the actual uh, word properly means criterion. All right. So why do you use well, so why do you use the term criterion? I, I don't understand. Sorry, I can't answer it. that. Right. So it's not my position on critiquing. It's your position. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So then, then, yeah. when I, then when I, then when I ask you the question, you should be answering for my paradigm. But it's fine. Okay. So the, the point is, the point is, is that we got to get to your side. Yeah. 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 So, so, yes. So, 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 so the point is, is that it's a criterion in a general sense. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, the Quran is as, stuff, as so. part of. Yeah, no, because I, I, I was letting you ask that last question, and then Dean was supposed yeah, to. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna finish. Yeah, I'm just gonna quickly finish off. So, the Quran tells me it's a criterion, it's a mahaman in a general sense. It's not absolute. Yet again, uh, it's like a shoehorning of uh, of a contention. And secondly, uh, it point as part of being the criterion, it points me towards uh, stuff that such as the hadiths, as such as going to the people of knowledge, that will help help me in determining um, to distinguish between right and wrong. Also, so that's part of it being the criterion. All right. Thanks for that. So now we're going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Dean. Let me know when you want me to press the start button and you can go ahead and start your cross. Yeah, sure. Just give me just give me about a minute. OK. In the meantime, everybody, make sure you hit the like button. If there are um, Muslims in the chat, I would like for you guys to uh have some questions ready for chris when we finish this up because uh, ibrahim made a excellent point that we do have a majority christian audience so uh, most of the questions are going to go for him, for him so we're going to pick three and three and so um muslims in the chat please come through and get your questions ready for chris um so that we can have a balanced QA. all right dean let me know yeah, so you can start now. All right. Um, so, Chris, do you believe that the author of the Quran is trying his best to present a consistent, non-contradictory message to the, mass to the masses in order for them to convert to Islam? Well, awesome. Okay, that's a big question. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't actually think that the Quran is written to be specifically historical. I think it's more written to be polemical. 
So that's why I think it incorporates um, things that are outside Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for example, because I don't think it cares about whether that's historically true or not. I think it's more trying to demonstrate that Muhammad is a prophet by having these accounts refer back to Muhammad. Uh, please, so, please answer. Yeah, but please answer the question. So the question okay. is: Is it? Is it, question, is it? Be more concise in your question. Is it? Yeah. So it, is it? Is the Quran? Okay. To put it simply, is the Quran trying to present a consistent, non-contradictory message? It depends how you mean that. So it, if the Quranic author is presenting a an account or a narrative within within the 114 chapters well, that's what i, I don't is, actually is, is he seeking one author, uh, so. you, you asked me you asked me for clarification so let me clarify yep. so is is the quranic author trying his best not to uh have contradictions within his book to be honest I, i'm not sure if it is one author uh is the quranic author or authors um trying their best to be consistent uh i i don't know like well yeah i guess i'd say generally yeah but again, you need to be more specific about what you're talking about here. Don't ask broad questions. Would, 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 would the Quranic author want a P and not P within his book? To put it simply, would he want a contradiction in his book? Would, would he try his okay, best so, not to have so a contradiction? My, my Again, my view on this is Surah Nisa, I 82, says multiple contradictions show the Quran is not from God. It doesn't say a singular contradiction. So I actually don't think that's the intent <laughs> to worry about singular contradictions from a Quranic perspective. <laughs> Okay, sure. That, that is that is an answer. Okay. Uh, I mean, <laughs> ask concise questions. If you ask for my opinion about things, I'll give you my opinion. It is, it is, it is pretty concise. Okay, so do, do you believe the author of the Quran would be aware of the contents of the Injil at the time? So the Gospels at the time of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Would they be consistent? Sorry, would they be uh, aware of uh, the content that Jesus died and resurrected within the Gospels? Would he be aware that this is the content of the Injil at this time? See, my view is that he was aware of a lot of the Injil and he was aware of a lot of the Torah, but he wasn't able to distinguish between what was written in Scripture and what Christians and Jews were simply saying. And that's why you have a lot of hesitation from Hadith material later on about don't trust what they say. Um, right, right, right. Yeah. So, so, the, so the Quranic author knows that he's possibly uh, either contradicting oral tradition or contradicting the Bible, but he's uncertain. Um, well, I mean, I think he probably thinks that he knows that he's got it right. I think that's what he's banking on, yeah. Right, but he knows it's a possibility because you know, right now it's just a, it's a, it's a jab in the dark. He's jabbing in the dark, doesn't know if it's old tradition, doesn't know if it's the Bible, and yet is editing these traditions he's hearing. He knows it's possible that he's editing the Bible at this current point, what is written. He knows that's a possible thing that is occurring. Yeah, I mean, it depends if he heard the correct oral tradition, right? Because all tradition can have variants in it. Like Dr. Right. So, so, points out. Yeah, yeah. So, so the Quranic author knows it's possible that he's editing content within the scriptures, meaning you basically can see the point. Uh, another question is uh, Do you believe the author of the Quran would know that God rested? Do you believe the author of the Quran would know that God rested? Um, in, in, he in could have scripture. heard it. Yeah, he, he could have yeah. heard it. Yeah. And he's, he has no able to distinguish between it being the Torah or it being like a like a random tradition or tradition. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I mean, he himself, according to the Islamic narrative, can't read or write, so he actually can't verify it. But again, you, from your perspective, you just said that you don't believe the author is the, is, is the prophet, so you're shifting, you're going back. Well, I'm so unsure. Do you, do, 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 do you believe the author is the, the prophet or not? It, so my view would be there's many authors, but one probably is someone who was referred to Muhammad, yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> it seems like whenever it benefits you, you say it's Muhammad. When when it doesn't benefit you, you say it's a group. Right. No, this is uh, my opinion that I've stated on my channel many times. So, uh, do you believe that um, the author of the Quran would be exposed to some uh, some material that Asamadi was the one that created the golden calf and not Aaron? Could potentially be the case. Yeah. Do you have any evidence for this? Um, no. Or, or so it's completely ad hoc. Nice. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, it has to be explained somehow, right? Yeah. Right. So it's, it has to be. Yeah, it has to be explained. All right, I'm out. I can't engage. Sorry, my bad. Okay. Uh, no worries. Okay. Do you believe that an, an argument from silence is inherently fallacious, or is it only fallacious in certain uh, conditions? Yeah, that's correct. Um, I mean, I'm, I don't. To be very direct, yes, you're correct that silent uh, argument from silence is not necessarily fallacious. It depends on the context. Right. And in what context is it not fallacious? Well, it wouldn't be expected. 
where, where, where it wouldn't be expected. No, where it would be expected, you mean? It wouldn't be fallacious. Sorry. Uh, yeah, where, where it would be expected. Yeah, yeah. Where it would be expected. Okay. Yeah. Would you expect that uh, the Christians and Jews at the time of the Prophet <laughs> uh, would be, no? do you expect that at least one person at the time of the Prophet ﷺ would notice that there's an apparent contradiction here? It between the Quran affirming the Bible? It depends on what all traditions are saying. It seems like you're positing a conspiratorial uh, oral tradition or, or Torah. You're doing a John Fontaine here. Um, it's it's not. I mean, okay. So let's go with the Injil, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But did they also think that there were sayings of Jesus in other stuff? That would explain yeah. why the Quran includes it. So, do you have any evidence of these extra uh, extra biblical narrations or oral traditions? Or are you only positing that as an ad hoc explanation? It's the best explanation by inference to the fact that the Quran quotes them directly. Yeah. Your alternative would be Allah revealed them. Right. Um, did Jesus uh, believe in all of the oral law that the Pharisees were teaching? Uh, I'm going to say no. Uh, do you believe in Matthew 23, Jesus is commanding the disciples to obey absolutely everything that the Pharisees teach? Is it absolutely everything? Yep. I'm asking. I'm, I'm asking. Okay, so he's not. All right. So you believe this is a general statement where Jesus is saying to obey the Pharisees, where there's exceptions and it's not an absolute thing, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't you have that level of uh, charitability when you read the Quran? Very simple, because the Quran makes it absolutely clear that it affirms the injil, and you have nothing to stand on unless you stand on the injil. The injil was revealed from God. And yeah, you have to stand on the Christians and you will be considered the disbelievers if you don't. The, as you admitted, the major narrative is one that Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is divine. You admitted that. Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, that, that's, that, that's a red herring. If you, if you don't, just don't bring up red herrings. Are all, are all hadiths inauthentic according to you? Uh, it's unknown. Right, it's unknown. So how can you posit that? You po Wait, you posited before. Did you not posit before that the hadiths are just basically, you can just dismiss all of them? Yeah, from a historical point of view, yes, which many scholars hold that view because it's impossible to know, to trace back the, the science of Hadith, for example, uh, that there's been many critiques of. So, yeah, you don't know is, is the honest answer. Can you, can you give me one criticism? Worth quoting them. Right. So is there anything specifically when I gave you the Hadith where the Prophet says himself that uh, the Injil and Torah, they've distorted the, their books and it's authentic according to Sahih Muslim and Bukhari. Uh, do you have anything on with you right now that would lead you to assume that this particularly is inauthentic from the Prophet? Um, no, my, my critique is that it, it doesn't say what you think it says. It doesn't refer to universal corruption. So, so you so you believe that the Prophet, you concede within that hadith that the Prophet uh, is saying that the Injil and Torah, during his time, people are corrupting it. Yeah, like that's that's obvious in the text. It's just that you want to infer from that universal corruption, and that's what I deny. And I asked you to give proof, and you haven't given it. Um, so you appeal to, um, I think it was Gabriel Reynolds. Is Gabriel Reynolds a mm -hmm. scholar you appeal to? In, he's, he's someone you appeal to in your, your videos, correct? One yes. minute. Uh, does he believe the author of the Quran edits material that he hears from the Jews and Christians? I think he's very carefully diplomatic about that, my understanding. Expand. As in, he, he doesn't explicitly say. I think he tries to, to be very uh, critical, but not um, uh, making his opinions known. He tries to stick purely to scholarship. Well, Gabriel Reynolds says in his book, The Quran and the Bible, um, 30 he, says, he says in page three, uh, the Quran has not simply borrowed material from Jews or Christians. This is just page three of his work. The Quran has not simply borrowed material from Jews or Christians. Instead, it has consciously reshaped biblical material to advance its own religious claims. Uh, Are so you sure had, you're not had, quoting had, someone who gives a foreword? Because I've read no, that. This, this is Gabriel Said Reynolds' book, page three, the Quran and the Bible on his commentary of the Quran. Okay, well, maybe he does then. Maybe I'm mistaken. Do you have any other scholar who do you have any scholar that affirms your view that the Quran absolutely that's affirms that's the Bible? That's time, fellas. That was not my view. It never has been my view. In this debate, yeah. that was not my view. I see, I have no that's scholar. That's <laughs> that's time. That's time. What, that's my view. Oh, go on. Yeah. Look, hmm. Um uh, okay, so 
we are going into the three minutes uh, closing. Uh, are we going to do Q&A before closing or after? After. Okay. After, after. Yeah. All right. So hold on. Let me get it ready. Three minutes closing up. Whenever you feel like it, uh, Chris, I'll just address the audience. You let me know when you're ready. Everybody, make sure you guys hit the like button on the, on the stream. Um, Muslims, again, like I said, get your questions ready. If you're watching and you're a Muslim, we're going to do three questions for each um, participant. So we have a large, uh, you know, Christian audience. So we're hoping that we can see the Muslims in here and you guys can, you know, ask a question. So um, let's try to, and moderators, if you guys can help me also seek out the Muslim questions in the, in the chat. Okay. Um, with that being said, Chris, whenever you're ready. Ladies and gentlemen, what you watch tonight is someone be completely unable to defend against the Islamic dilemma. He has to talk in generalities, despite the fact his own criteria backfires on himself. He says, yeah, we support the majority of the Torah, and that seems to be a good reason to know that we can generally say we affirm the Torah. But when it comes to the Injil, he completely abandons that criteria and says, okay, well, the majority of the Injil has been corrupted, but we can still say we affirm it? How does that make any sense? Even the narratives in the Injil contradict his own prophet and contradict the Quran. And yet for some reason, he still feels like he can say prophets can do this. Prophets can, can indeed affirm corrupted books. That is bizarre, and I've never heard that perspective, but hey, he can square that with his uh, Muslim friends and so on after the debate. Now, the, the point I've, I've hammered through this whole thing, I'm not talking about affirming the whole of the Bible. I was very explicit. Rewind to the beginning of my introductory statement. I said, all I need to do is show the Quran affirms the Torah and the Injil. I don't need all of the Bible. But through his presentation, and even in his own concluding remarks, or at least a few moments ago, he was still saying, I'm talking about all of the Bible. That's incorrect. For some reason, he hasn't paid attention there. Dean, you need to rewind and watch this video. You'll see you've made a bit of a mistake there. It is absolutely clear through evidence that the Torah cannot be corrupted universally. That is a bizarre claim. We have manuscripts, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Greek Septuagint. We have P52 for the Injil and, and many more uh, manuscripts that demonstrate the narratives, the meaning, the stories in these scriptures have not changed. I mean, even Ibn Taymiyyah, understands this point. Ibn Taymiyyah in his own works has said, look, the Christians think that we claim that the whole of the Injil and the whole of the Torah has been corrupted. We don't say that. Well, that's odd. And yet we have Dean over here seeming to imply that actually, yeah, no, 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 they were, were completely corrupted. It goes against Ibn Taymiyyah on this aspect, which is very strange. The earliest um, commentators, Tafsir writers, Ibn Ishaq, Al-Tabari, Ibn, uh, Ibn Qutba, they felt free to quote from the Gospels and use them as authentic sources. They did not see them as universally corrupt at all. That's a much later view. He couldn't answer the fact that his own crime is not a criteria to solve the problem of prophets committing sin in the Torah and also seemingly in the Quran. So how's the Quran a criteria? He had no answer. He went on a weird tangent about silence of things. I'm not sure what happened in that, uh, that, that questioning from him. I, I think you need to prepare better questions. But yeah, generally, generally speaking, in my summary, Jesus is Lord. The Islamic dilemma passes, and Dean has failed to defend it on this occasion. God bless. Take care. Thank you so much, Chris at Speaker's Corner. Um, and now to st um, start your time, Dean. Yeah, you can uh, start it now. Okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, Chris has not just only shown his uh, ignorance of uh, the Quran, as well as the own scholars that he quotes, but he's also shown his uh, ignorance on uh, logical fallacies as well, right? Uh, <laughs> he has, he, he in no way addressed the uh, issue of uh, there being a silence of this being an issue in the first generation of Muslims, despite us expecting evidence for that. Uh, he just said, he just waved as like an argument for silen uh, from silence. Um, another issue is uh, the one scholar that you heard him quote, um, Reynolds, uh, <laughs> from page three of his book it contradicts him <laughs> so like he's, he's not doing thorough research as well as uh he's not consistent as i mentioned uh as you was, like if you just replay matthew 23 he says you know this is general it's a general a general affirmation uh being made for what the pharisees are teaching it's not absolute have that level of charitability with the quran and be consistent my friend 
right? This isn't an Islamic dilemma. If we have an Islamic dilemma, then you have, then you have a, a Pharisee dilemma, right? Where you have to obey all the oral laws of the Pharisees. If, you're gonna, if you want me to be as uncharitable as you, then uh, be consistent. And we would have to say that, okay, the Pharisees and all the oral laws, we should obey them. But guess what? Jesus opposes some of the oral laws. It seems like a Christian dilemma to me. Uh, then another point to bring up, he, he just regurgitates like, Stuff, stuff he hears um, generally about like Ibn Taymiyyah's view, all right? Uh, when did I ever claim an absolute universal corruption to the point where it's 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 all corrupt? I, I never claimed that. My my view is in conformity with with Qutayba. It's it's uh, in conformity with Ibn Taymiyyah. It's in conformity with the vast majority of uh, the classical scholarship, even Ibn Ishaq, where he quotes the Gospel of John. He never conforms it. He never confirms it fully, and neither does he deny it fully. I, I'm within that camp. I'm within the early scholarship camp, where uh, we generally affirm the, uh, these scriptures, uh, as I told you, and yeah, and and as I mentioned before, uh, within the criteria of why we call the Torah Kitab Allah, why we call it the Book of Allah, just because I have a certain reason to call it the Book of Allah doesn't mean then I have to um, have that consistent with why I consider the Injil the Injil, right? That's the specific criteria for the Torah. This is why it's dignified so much. This is why we have indications where it's called Kitab Allah. The Injil is never called Kitab Allah. So there's a distinction being made. Even Taymi even, even has this view. He has this view that not uh, much from the Torah has, has been corrupted. However, the Injil has much more uh, corruptions. Uh, how much, what's my time? 30 seconds. Uh, to just conclude, uh, if you just go back to my questioning, uh, Chris actually indirectly conceded the debate, saying that the author, or the author of the Quran, actually uh, is jabbing in the dark and is uh, is allowing for there to be room for the author of the Quran to edit parts of the Bible. Does, the author of the Quran does not have certainty that he's only taking from old traditions because he's possibly editing biblical traditions and has no problem with that. What does that show you about his attitude towards the Bible? All right, and yeah, that's my closing statement. All right. Thank you so much, Dean and Chris, for um, participating in the debate. Uh, we're now going to go into the question and answer uh, segment. So I see a lot of Christians already do have questions already ready. Um, I'm trying to hope to see uh, Muslim questions for Chris so that we can balance this out, guys. So. Go ahead and participate. I know that you guys are up in here. Um, you guys want to hear more from your guests, from the guests here, from the debaters here tonight? Their YouTube channels are linked in the title of the uh, of the video here. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and let's see what we got here. Uh, Okay, so we got a question from Imam One Way Chris Claus for Dean. He says, If the New Testament isn't the Injil, can you show us any manuscript of this Injil that is not the New Testament? Sure, I'll go to Kurdic Sinaiticus. You can find uh, the Gospel Mark, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. You can find uh, other Gospels as well within manuscript traditions. Uh, they will have contents of the Injil. Maybe you didn't understand my position when I laid it out. My position is that there's manuscripts you have, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, as well as other Gospels contain parts of the Injil. I think you're conflating my position with the John Fontaine view. All right. And Chris, if you want to say, at, you know, add in, you're also allowed to give a response. Same with you, Dean, with a, a question to Chris and he responds. Oh, you I have a lot wait, wait, but, but I'm, but, but, but I'm going to, right. But if that occurs, then it's a question for me, so I'm going to have to get the final say, right? No, it's just a question. You answer, and then he gives a little, you know, minute response or thirty second response, whatever. That doesn't make yeah. any sense. Like it should be me giving the final say because it's a question for me. No, it's just a, it's just Q and A, man. Q I've seen it done both ways. What, what, Chris? Are you fine with Dean's way? Because I've seen debates where both ways work. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it's going to be for, fair for both parties, right? So it's yeah. not like a disadvantage thing because on Chris's side, he'd have the last word. So it's just what yeah. I mean, I mean the, the question is targeted at, uh, at me. So like, why should I not have the final say? Because oh, I don't. Yes. All right, fine. If you want to say something, uh, Chris, to that, you, you can. If anything, no? uh, I was going to point out. Yeah, it's not sufficient for you to point out any sort of like textual manuscript differences or variations, you actually need to show a Islamic Njil or an Islamic Torah, uh, which you cannot do because most of this thing exists. That's all I was going to add. Yeah, so uh, just like a final say on that. 
Uh, we have zero, let me repeat, zero uh, first century New Testament manuscripts. We have zero first century uh, manuscripts of the Torah. Uh, wait, can you not interrupt? We have zero. No, no, because the idea was that you wouldn't, you wouldn't respond to me. That's yeah. What? That's, that's what he said. No, I mean, Chris, you like allowed it, so I. I no, no, well, he, no, he no, no, no. I, I said okay. I even I said I'll agree to do his way of things, and then God Logic said okay. But Chris, if you wanted to say what you wanted to say, you could say that. But now, right, 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 right. So, so I'm responding. So I'm responding to the question. It's it's fine. It's it's fine. I'll respond to the question. Stop interrupting me. Let's, right, let's, let's, let's be clear about what's happening, okay? So we're going to do the question at question answer. D, whoever is the targeted, you know, the question who is the target of, I say they answer the question, and then the opponent gets a gives their opinion on the statement being made, and we move on to the next question. That's the what I say. Made, the statement being made by who? By by the other individual. So right? if I have a question for Dean, you answer my question. Chris gives his uh, statement on the on your answer or the question, and we move on to the next question. Chris just agreed that we okay, whatever. Like you yeah, can, I thought, you can, Chris uh, agreed that then the what? initial person will have another response. Yeah, Chris. Wait, Chris so just then, agreed to that. Let me just let me just gonna go. Yeah. So thought, are you no, saying no, that you no, would no, just no, go I, back and forth? What do you want? No, to no, do? no, no. What I'm somewhere. Yeah, it would end with me because I I'm being asked the question. We're over here debating on a Q and A. Wait, like, what's the point? So what's the point of answering the question? Let me respond, and then you respond that to my response. What's the point? Sense. It's just I mean, you're basically is, just debating. This is this is how this is how it's usually formatted. Yeah, it is. I've never seen that format like that. I've never seen that before. It, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Like you, you, we can just do. I mean, it's either we do that or we do. I, I just answer it. That, that, that's on. That's only thing I'm happy just with. Let him. Whoever has been asked the question answers it. Leave it at that. That's that's it, yeah, I think I think that's good. Yeah. All right, fine. Let's see here. Um, I'm not seeing a question for Chris. Um, how likely you think? Uh... All right, let me see. Maybe this is. No, th this is no, not. No, I think this is. This is, is, a... this is no? actual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, man, I only see questions for, for Dean. <laughs> You want uh, me to ask the question to Chris? Huh? Yeah, if you have a question, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, for this one, Dean will have the opportunity to respond. Yeah. Because why? Wait, why? Because what? for the first one, uh, Chris had the opportunity oh, yeah. to respond to make it equal. Dean was. It's only fair. Happy. Yeah, it's it's, it's only fair. Yeah, it's okay, do I get now. to respond to that? Like. No, no, no. Because Dean didn't do that originally. Basically, so, uh, just for this one question, we're going to have Dean respond because in Dean's initial question, Chris had and then, an And then Chris gets the last word on that. No, no, because that didn't happen in the first question. It did just happen. No, I, I never... No, he, no, he, he interjected. Yeah, Dean didn't get a final... This is why I just keep I think, it... At, I think it's just it fair to, uh, I think it would be fair to do it this question this way, this, this and then the rest of them, just the person who's questioned answers. Otherwise, it would be unfair. To, otherwise, it would be yeah. unfair. Right? It's not unfair. There's no there. This is literally unaffected. It's Chris, what unaffected. do you think? Because because the, for the first one, you did get an opportunity to talk, so I think it would just be fair. And then all of that got shut down. Yeah, yeah. Um, we got logic here. I think we should just continue with what we agreed now. Yeah, just. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It would yeah. not be. It would not be equal. Is it is thing. equal. No, because chris had a whole uh no, no, uh, I'm, I'm, equal in rule but we're not gonna, an outcome. Uh, just we're not going to be spending time debating this so I'll we're going to stick to what we agreed to you're going to ask your question to chris yeah, I think it's unfair, it. but i'll ask the question this time. uh chris you quote gabriel reynolds now uh he has a whole commentary called the quran and the bible and i've read a lot of it and the whole point is he's going basically ayah by ayah in the Quran, and he's trying to connect as uh, almost every ayah of the Quran to something in the Bible or something in rabbinic literature and, and whatnot. And he's basically showing how the Quran is sometimes agreeing with something that's in these previous texts, or it's correcting it. He even goes so far as to saying uh, there are times where the Quranic uh, phrasing is influenced by the Hebrew of the Bible, and it's it's responding to the he, actual Hebrew and making a pun on the Hebrew. So if the, if the author of the Quran has such extensive knowledge of the Bible that it not only knows the Bible, but 
rare traditions, like the Talmud wasn't popular uh, at that point. It was popular in Babylonia, but not here. And it even is responding to the Hebrew, but according to you at the same time, he doesn't even know that the gospels say that Jesus died. How do you square that up? How can you have so much knowledge that we have a whole commentary and Hebrew puns and all this, but at the same time, he doesn't even know that the gospels say that Jesus crucified. It doesn't make any sense to me. That's a really good question. So it is true, right, that the Quran has a lot of knowledge on the Torah and also Talmud and other things as well, and also the Injil in what it considers to be the Injil. It assumes the reader has knowledge of these things, but at the same time, it contradicts, right? So Gabriel Reynolds' position, uh, if you go to his channel, you can hear him uh, say it in one of his videos. He says he basically thinks the Quran doesn't care about what the canon is for the Injil. And that's why it includes other things like Gospel of uh, James and, and so on. Um, so what I would say is I don't actually, I'm not convinced that 4157, it, understood in the traditional Muslim way, is correct. That would be my response, ultimately. Um, I don't think that is what it's intended. I tend to be more along those um, people who look at it in line of Surah 1933. Um, I think it's Surah 355, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's more refuting the Jews in their understanding of what they have done by having the Messiah killed. I think it's basically saying, no, it wasn't you that did this, because only Allah is the one who allows these things to happen. So uh, that would be my understanding of that. All right. Thank you for that. Um, do you guys have anybody that, you know, maybe has sent you guys, texted you guys a question or anything like that? Nothing going on? No. All right. Just to, just to keep it fair, because I'm not seeing any Muslims here. I don't want to drag this out. Is it okay if we just wrap this up right here? It's, it's, it's fine if you you can go through the questions. Like, I'll just answer them. It's fine. I, I think someone might come on. Uh, I'm seeing on Twitter. Otherwise, I can ask the other two questions. It's just if there are more questions for Dean, like two more questions. Unless someone else comes on or you can find something. Like, it's your choice, whatever you guys want to do. It's going to be the, the Q&A for me, Brian. <laughs> I mean, uh, nothing. Else. You know, when I did a debate, I actually had one person who kept asking the questions too. So I think sometimes this happens. I think it's because uh, you know Dean isn't the biggest channel, so he wouldn't bring over that many Muslims. All right. So, question for Dean here. Um, question for Dean and. <laughs> It's not relevant. Like, I, I don't see why I would answer this. No, no, like, let, me, let me get the question out. In your intro, right. you presented yeah. Isaiah 9. Do you assert that Muhammad is the child to be born, generally speaking? Yeah, so uh, I don't know what you mean by generally speaking. It, it's, it, there's like the law of excluded middle. Either he is or he isn't. I don't know what you mean by generally speaking. Uh, the second thing would just be that uh it has nothing to do with this like i put up the septuagint uh translation it's actually a lot more nuanced uh on what mighty god exactly means in that passage i know you might be laughing but it's a, a lot more nuanced than that I, I you, right. bro, this comment is crazy yeah 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 it's fine yeah so yeah yeah the, the, the whole point the whole point is that um the companion salman the pharisee had knowledge of isaiah 9 but he doesn't he doesn't have knowledge that the book he's going to believe in contradicts fundamentally with the book that he was familiar with, which is like the Torah and the Injil. It makes no sense, right? So th that was the main point with that. Yeah, okay. I don't know why do uh, why uh, Avery, you're laughing at that. I'm laughing because it was funny what he called him. He called him question for Dean Ibn General when he was saying generally this, generally that. That's what made it funny. Uh, yeah, I mean, you laughed earlier at the stuff you thought. Yeah, about. I laughed because you were laughing initially. No, no, I didn't. Because if you remember in the beginning, I was really professional, but I saw you acting a bit unprofessional. So I no, I wasn't laughing, but don't try to throw it. I out. saw it. I saw it. <laughs> I, I smile. We lighthearted here. I didn't put my head on my my show on my face. Well, that. I, you know, I don't have the subtle acting skills of Avery, so I had to like play it up for. Him. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. I guess, Ibrahim, if you have a second question. Okay. I think the third question might be from someone else, but he didn't write the question yet. So I'll, I'll ask that. Okay. So uh, so you said that you don't think the, that that I is about Jesus being crucified, not being crucified, even though in your opening statement, that's what you presented. But again, if the Quran has so much extensive knowledge, 
even to the point where it's interacting with the Hebrew and rare texts, rare texts like the Talbot, then surely the author of the Quran knows that in certain cases it's intentionally uh, contradicting what the Bible says. Doesn't that show us that he doesn't believe the Bible is fully preserved? I mean, it would be impossible to think that he even knows the Hebrew, but he accidentally makes mistakes about certain details of the story, even though certain details come up as like refutations, like Solomon didn't disbelieve instead of saying like that, that seems like a response. So what I'm saying is when we find contradictions between the Quran and the Bible, a Quran that even knows deep knowledge, doesn't that show that the author's attitude towards the Bible is that it's not fully preserved. So first of all, you mentioned that uh, I brought up Surah Anisa I 157. I brought that up because it's my opponent's paradigm. It, it's kind of irrelevant what I have about my own personal views of the text. I'm talking about my opponent's views on the text. And he holds to the classical Sunni position on that. And that's why it's important for him. But for me, who has no skin in this game, because I'm not a Muslim, so I don't need to defend the Quran, I'm free to have my own opinion on it. Um, so yeah, the idea that if you find disagreements, that the best position to take is that the Quran is aware of this and is correcting it, I think, again, is somewhat circular. Um, it kind of assumes the very point we want to demonstrate, which is the Islamic dilemma is trying to get at the whole idea is the Quran actually reliable? But if you assume that as your starting point, the Quran is reliable and hence must be correcting rather than be an error, then that's kind of circular. So um, you need to bring up additional arguments as to why that's the case. I think it's more plausible to think that the Quran authors did not have a defined understanding as to what the canon was. They felt free to borrow from a wide range of sources. And it wasn't in the context of historicity. It was in the context largely of polemics. Um, that seems to be more plausible to account for the fact that broad statements are made. There's no distinction between the Injil and Torah. There's never this understanding that there's this Injil over here in the Quran and then there's this like corrupted one over here in the Quran. No, it just uses the term Injil or people of the book. Um, it never splits this. It never predicates any form of corruption explicitly to them. In fact, scholars have pointed out, um, Dr. Gordon Nickel is a good example. He, in his book, he points out that all the verses that talk about the Injil and the Torah directly, by name, are never negative. Not a single one. Every single one is positive. The verses of corruption, so Surah so Bakla 79, Surah Imran 78, Surah Maida 13, so, so on and so forth, they're all in the context of people doing stuff with the book. Uh, it's never explicitly mentioned Torah or Injil. So, yeah. That's, that's kind of my view on it. All right. Thank you so much. And then we have a question for Dean here. Dean, in the citation you gave for Dr. Gabriel's book, The Bible and the Quran, page three, did you read the literal next sentence? Yeah, sure. We can read it together. <clears throat> Um, one second. Okay, so I, I don't have like the exact link for his book right now on hand. I can pull it, pull it up. Yeah, if yeah, if you can. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me see. Is, I, I do uh, have the screenshot. Okay, you know what? I can send it to you. All right. Instead, so he wants the literal next sentence. I yeah. So, let, so, let, so, so let me just reiterate what he says before. So. What he says before is, uh, yet yet the Quran's author also played an active role in a, in developing biblical material. The Quran has not simply borrowed material from Jews or Christians; instead, it has consciously reshaped biblical material to advance its own religious claims. Yeah, I sent the next uh, sentence on Discord. Right. My you. argument is that the Quran. Sorry, one second. My argument is that the Quran is so closely, so organically related to the Bible represents a departure from the traditional ideas that the background of uh, the Qur'an is largely pa pagan and partially Jewish. I don't see how this uh, helps his case that he actually does hold to the view that the Qur'an affirms the Bible. That was the main point, right? The main point of me citing Gabriel Reynolds is to show that he himself does not believe that the Qur'an uh, affirms the Bible. Like his, his arguments of what the origins of the Qur'an are, whether it's Jewish or pagan, like I don't see the relevancy. Well, that's that's what he thinks it means by Bible in this context, right? 
Right. Now, would he be if he's saying that he's taking, uh, if he's saying that the author of the Quran is taking all of its sources from I, I know what he's. I I can explain what he's saying. So, what he's saying is that basically, you know how the Muslim Muslims say that uh, the audience was like Quraysh, the pagan Arabs. So there are some secular scholars who think that the, actually the audience in the Quran orally. They had like a lot of biblical knowledge and there were Jews and Christians in Mecca. Now, my opinion on this is ridiculous, but just uh, that I think this is a ridiculous claim, but that's basically what he means. Yeah. So, 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 Gabe, so Gabriel Reynolds, like if you're, if, it's, if you're trying to pause it, like the first sentence is very clear. The Quran's author also played an active role in developing biblical material. The Quran has not simply borrowed material from Jews or Christians. Instead, it has consciously reshaped biblical material to advance its own religious claims. Biblical material, not just like some or tradition that's not biblical. My argument that the Quran is so closely, so organically related to the Bible represents a departure from traditional ideas that the Quran uh, of the Quran is largely pagan and partly uh, Jewish. Uh, yeah, there's there's nothing there's nothing here that um, uh, contradicts the point I was making from Gabriel Reynolds' book. The idea is that he doesn't think that the Quran oh, holds correct. to just the canon as the normal understanding of what the biblical text is. Right. So and when it does, quotes, does, he, does he believe that he's does he believe that the Quranic author is reshaping biblical uh, ideas? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For polemics, okay. largely for, for, to demonstrate yeah. the validity of Muhammad. Yeah. But he so, borrows so, from. Is that compatible? Is that is that view is, is that view compatible with the Quran affirming the Bible? Absolutely. It actually makes the Islamic dilemma worse if that's the case for you. All right, let's get this next question out for... Um, I, don't mind, I don't mind, yeah, Chris, Chris can explain that. I, actually, I want you to explain. So, uh, Gabriel Reynolds saying that the author of the Quran consciously edits passages from the Bible. Let's this be the last exchange on this. Right, it does, yeah, last one's fine. So, how, how does this make it worse? This, this just proves the whole point. Because it's no longer the case that you have to find a way of remedying, remedying the statements in the Quran with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as the Injil, for example. But if the Injil, as the Quran understands it, is a much wider corpus that includes the Gospel of James, potentially the Gospel of Pseudo Matthew, potentially the Gospel, uh, the Syriac Infancy Gospel, you then have to explain how it's possible that the Quran can affirm those things generally when those texts are, well, let's just say they're not Islamic. So, yeah, yeah. you'd have to just marry yeah, it. Yeah, it, yeah, as I said before, it, it not being Islamic, one, uh, it presupposes a sort of interpretation that you can't reconcile certain things, like you mentioned before, of like uh, Jesus being the son of God, there's possible reconciliations as well for a lot of these these materials. And secondly, uh, it, there not being possible reconciliations on parts of these uh, Gospels doesn't disqualify anything from being able to be generally confirmed. So the, I, I, think that's all for, I, think, I think that's all for this exchange. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think that was, that was helpful. I think that's funny. All right. We need a question for Chris now. Yeah, I'll see if we can get one. Did the person send a question, Ibrahim? Yeah, I think they were uh, asking about uh, Jeremiah 8.8. 8. So they say, okay. how can Christians interpret Jeremiah 8.8? 8? How can we say we are wise and the Torah of the Lord is with us when in fact the lying pen of the scribes has produced a deception? And basically also that if the Quran is confirming the Bible, it would also be confirming this verse, which is confirming the corruption in the Bible. Again, the, the problem with this is not universal corruption. And this is this is something that I really want you Muslims to think about generally. It's not sufficient enough um, for you to say there's just been some kind of textual corruption. You need to demonstrate total universal corruption and to be honest it's not even just of a text you need to do it for a meaning um and i think dean you, i mean you, you even said near the end that you don't even hold to the view it's been totally universally corrupt but if you hold to that uh, i i just thought I'd, i think you've conceded the point by even saying that that you don't think that the torah and the jewel have been universally corrupted but yeah i don't think jeremiah 8 8 demonstrates universal corruption so that would be an answer to that all right and that's that. That's the Q&A section. Thank you guys for the debate. Um, this was good. Good little back and forth. I appreciate yeah, you know, good fun. everybody coming through. Good topic. Ibrahim, thanks for uh, stepping in and being a co-mod and, you know, just helping out. Appreciate it. And uh, that's that. So, like I said, guys, if you guys want to hear more from 
the uh, debaters today. Their YouTube channels are in the title. Um, also, we got a bonus question for Dean. Um, did Avery successfully uh, beat John's position, John Fontaine's position? Uh, yeah, a, a, an infant could uh, destroy uh, John Fontaine's position. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't hold. I, I don't believe it's tenable. So whether whether Avery did or not, it's not. It's not something that uh, you should be proud over. Like it's just. It's not a tenable position at all. I'd like to debate John Fontaine one day on this. So I'm kind of hoping that when I absolutely destroy him in debates, it took a little bit more than an infant to do it. But yeah, I, I agree 